الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد فاطمة بضعة مني يؤذيني ما آذاها The first of our loud salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The second even louder salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi wa sallam. The third in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa al-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Fatimiyya as a commemoration and the events that unfolded in the last days of the life of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam are discussed in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. One would be surprised that Fatimiyya would be discussed in these two works which are seen as being the two most famous works of the non-Shia schools. And the reality that many people would assume that Fatimiyya would be that which only would be discussed by the Shia. When we come and commemorate Fatimiyya, we commemorate the tragedy that befell Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. We befell the final days, we look at those final days and examine what happened to the daughter of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Normally, Fatimiyya is assumed to be a Shi'i commemoration. If you look around the world today, the only sect that in reality discusses Fatimiyya are the Shi'a. But you'll see that many of the Shi'a themselves do not know that within Bukhari and within Muslim, many of the incidents that befell Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam in her final days are clearly discussed. This is of the utmost importance for a number of reasons. On the first level, if my non-Shi'i friend asks me that why is it that you commemorate Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and you discuss the fact that she was oppressed or that she died angry or that Fatima al-Zahra was unjustly treated or that she was buried secretly or that Imam Ali buried her secretly, I could say that it's not only in my books. If it was only in my books, then someone could turn around and say, well, you're Shia, your books are biased. If Fatimiyya is discussed in your books, then you're only portraying one side of the story. But when I see Fatimiyya being discussed in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, it highlights to me that I can have enough proof to discuss this with other schools in Islam. Because for the other schools in Islam, these two books are placed just after the Quran. If you go to any member of the Sunni community today and you ask them that how do you view Bukhari and Muslim, they'll say to you that Bukhari and Muslim are two of the, if not the most important books of hadith in Muslim history. You then say to them, what happened to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Is it this? Bukhari and Muslim, they'll say to you, yes. In some cases, however, there are some members of the non-Shi'i world who do not know about what is discussed in terms of the final days of Fatima al-Zahra's life in Bukhari and Muslim. How many times have you sat with someone who's not Shia and you've said to them, for example, that I'm going to the mosque to commemorate Fatima al-Zahra's last days and that Fatima al-Zahra was oppressed and that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam died angry with certain personalities, many of them will turn around to you and say that I don't know anything about this. This is somewhat interesting in the year 2022. About 30, 40, 100, 200 years ago, one would think, okay, not everyone necessarily has access to all these pieces of literature. But today, in the world of the internet, reality is it's accessible for everyone. Therefore, for me as a Shi'i, when I come to Fatimiyya, many times I assume that what I'm commemorating is only in my literature. I'll only find Fatimiyya in Al-Kafi, for example, 
or I'll only find Fatimiyya in Kamil Ziyarat, for example. Or I'll only find Fatimiyya in the works of Sheikh Al-Tusi, for example. However, when I examine Sahih Al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, and I'm able to open the page and show the reference in relation to the final days of the life of Fatima السلام, then my argument is not one just from my books. My argument becomes one from the books of other schools in Islam. Yes, we must admit one thing. Not every part of the final days of the life of Fatima السلام, is discussed in Bukhari and Muslim. For example, the threat to burn the house of Fatima Zahra السلام, is not in Bukhari and Muslim. The pushing of the door on Fatima Zahra السلام, is not in Bukhari and Muslim. These incidents are not there in Bukhari and Muslim. However, Fatimiyya is not only about the pushing of the door and the burning of the house of Fatima. Fatima Zahra السلام, underwent other tragedies after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi died. A person can talk about the burning of the door. A person can talk about the miscarriage of the baby. But Bukhari and Muslim highlight to us that it wasn't only those incidents that are to be discussed. That rather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has already foretold that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam would be hurt. That Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam would be angered. That Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam would be oppressed. That Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam would ask to be buried secretly in the night by Imam Ali alayhi salam. When we hear in the Masaib every year that Imam Ali alayhi salam buried Fatima al-Zahra in the night and nobody was allowed to attend her funeral, sometimes we assume that this is only a Shia belief. Only the Shia believe in this thing. No, on the contrary, when a person opens Bukhari and Muslim, they'll see even within those texts, there is a discussion about Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, her final moments and her stand against the caliph of her time. On the second level, some people, when they interact with certain members of the non-Shia school, you'll see them maybe wanting to get married to non-Shia. Today I hear people, when they come towards us, they say that I'm Shia, but I might want to marry, for example, a Sunni boy, or I'm a Shia boy and I want to marry a Sunni girl. Of course, all of us come under the banner of Islam. But at the same time, before you get married, try and show what you believe to the person you want to get married to. There's no harm and no embarrassment for you to open Sahih al-Bukhari and say that, listen, you want to know why I have a particular commemoration called Fatimiyya? Because in Bukhari, it says this. In Muslim, it says this. Ultimately, from what they say, I conclude what I conclude. When you want to marry from another school in Islam, don't be ashamed of your belief. No, on the contrary. Say that, look, my belief is not just in my books. My belief is in your books as well. You should reflect on yourself as to your stand in relation to the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Let us tonight delve into Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and see how even in non-Shia books, Fatimiyya is discussed and what happened to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is clear for all of us to see. When you open Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, on the first level, it's important for us to look at certain traditions where the Holy Prophet highlights Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam and her position in relation to him. This is not Shia ahadith. This is Bukhari and Muslim. I open Sahih al-Bukhari or I go on the internet. I can go to a website like sunnah.com. On that website, I can search Fatima. When I search Fatima in Sahih al-Bukhari, there is a hadith where the Prophet gives us an indication in relation to Fatimiyya and why we commemorate Fatimiyya. Which hadith? The hadith says, Fatima bad'atun minni. Fatima is a part of me. Yu'zini ma'adaha. It hurts me whatever hurts her. Look at this hadith in Bukhari. You'd think it's a Shia hadith. 
because of how powerful the hadith is. Fatima is a part of me in itself requires its own analysis. When the Holy Prophet says Fatima bad'atun minni, that in itself, what does it mean? At the end of the day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had three other daughters. He had a daughter by the name of Zainab, a daughter by the name of Ruqayya, and a daughter by the name of Um Kulthum. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Sayyidah Khadija had four daughters. I know sometimes some Shia want to posit the opinion that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi only had one daughter because they find that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is so special. No, the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his family had four daughters. Those four daughters were all on different levels. Zainab was at a level, Ruqayya was at a level, Umm Kulthum was at a particular level. And those daughters, by the way, many of us as Shia have not dissected their lives. Some of those daughters went through oppression in their life because some of those daughters in their origin, you found that they were married to certain people who later left them because of the religion of Islam. These daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, never once does Rasulullah in Bukhari or Muslim say, Zainab bad'atun minni. Zainab is a part of me. Ruqayya, bad'atun minni. Um Kulthum, bad'atun minni. But for Fatima, she is the only daughter. He says, Fatima is a part of me. When he says Fatima is a part of me, I ask the question, Ya Rasulullah, but all four of them are your daughters. Why don't you say each one is a part of you? Some turned around and said, because those other three daughters, they died in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Still, Bukhari and Muslim discuss all aspects of the life of the Prophet. So why wouldn't the Prophet ever say, Zainab bad'atun minni, Ruqayya bad'atun minni, Um Kulthum bad'atun minni. No, Sahih al-Bukhari narrates that the Prophet said, Fatima bad'atun minni. Only Fatima is a part of me. No other daughter. But hold on, biologically, those other daughters are parts of you. We, if I have a daughter, that daughter is a part of me biologically. That meant that Bada'atun Minni was not biological relation. Bada'atun Minni was number one. Her nur and my nur are one. First level. Her nur and my nur are one. That my nur continues through her. Don't we say in ziyara about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Ashadu anna ka kunta nuran fil aslab al shamikha wal arham al mutahara. I swear, Ya Aba Abdullah, that you were a light that was being transferred through the purest of wombs. Lem tuna jiska al jahiliya bi anjasiha. Jahiliya never ever touched your line of the nur that was transmitted. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, his nur was transmitted to Fatima, not to Zainab, not to Um Kulthum, not to Ruqayya. Yes, they are a part of him biologically, but biologically them being a part of him is not what is being discussed. What's being discussed when he says Fatima is a part of me is that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family is saying what? He's saying that me and Fatima, number one, our nur is one nur. We the Shia, as I said, believe that the nur of Muhammad and Al Muhammad was created thousands of years before Adam alayhi salam. Number two, Fatima inherits my ilm. Many times, as Shia, we respect Fatima al Zahra. Why? Because she's the daughter of Rasulullah. No, no, no. Rasulullah's daughter also carried the ilm of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam carried the knowledge of the Quran, the knowledge of the ta'wil, and the tafsir, and the zahir, and the batin, and the nasikh, and the mansukh from the Quran. She was the one who could explain it. Her teacher was her father. Therefore, when he says she's a part of me, my ilm has been transferred to her. That's number two. Number three, my message and her message are one message. When Fatima talks about Islam, that's like me talking about Islam. When Fatima makes a decision about religion, that's me making that decision about religion. 
When Fatima says something is halal, I'm saying it's halal. When Fatima says something is haram, I'm saying it's haram. When Fatima says something is dhulm, I'm saying it's dhulm. When Fatima says something is oppression, I'm the one saying something is oppression. When Fatima speaks, I'm speaking. Therefore, Bukhari says, Fatima bad'atun minni. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said, Fatima is a part of me. This is not Shia hadith. This is in Sunni hadith. Then he says, Yu'dhini ma adaha. Therefore, when she's a part of me and we are one nur, and we are one message, and our ilm is one, then whoever hurts Fatima hurts me. Because when you hurt Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, in reality you're hurting me. What does the Quran say about those who hurt Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? If someone in the time of the Prophet hurt him, what does the Quran say? All of you go to Surah 33 verse 56 of the Quran, 57, 58. In Surah Al-Ahzab verse 56, many of you know the ayah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-Nabi, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Let's have a second louder salawat from your very strong chests insha'Allah. Louder salawat please. Allah. And a third in honor of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his blessings on the Holy Prophet and his angels. He orders us as believers to do that. However, in the next verse he says, Those who hurt Allah and his Prophet. What happens to them? لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ Allah does la'na on those who hurt the Prophet. Sometimes you hear people saying, why do the Shia do la'na? The Quran is doing la'na for me. The Quran is doing la'na for me. I don't even need to do la'na. The Quran is doing the la'na. Quran is saying what? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا مُهِينَ Quran says those who hurt Allah and his Prophet. Anyone who hurts Allah. How do you hurt Allah and his Prophet? How? What are the ways you hurt Allah and his Prophet? If you swear at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, you've hurt the Prophet, haven't you? If you, for example, come and torture one of his companions, someone like Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan, Abu Lahab, Walid ibn al-Mughira, those who hurt the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or those who killed some of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, Allah's la'na goes on them. Why? Because if you hurt the companions of Rasulullah, you hurt Rasulullah. Notice how the Quran equates whoever hurts Rasulullah as the one who hurts the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We agree? The Quran uses the same word which Bukhari uses to narrate about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Quran said what? Inna alladheena yu'zoon Allah wa rasoolahu Those who hurt Allah and his Prophet La'anahum Allah Allah does la'na on them. Someone says, what do you mean Allah does la'na? La'na means to withdraw mercy from someone. Allah withdraws his rahmah from them in this world and in the hereafter, and for them there is the most worst of punishments. وَالَّذِينَ Verse 58. يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Subhanallah. Those who hurt Allah and His Prophet, la'na on them. And those who hurt the believing men and women, not just Allah and His Prophet, and those who hurt the believing men and women, for no reason whatsoever, those people, for them, is the worst and most open punishment for it's a great sin. The Quran, what did it say? You could either hurt Rasulullah or you can hurt believers of the males and the females. 
can I as a Muslim today in my community, if I hurt a fellow Muslim, isn't that the most sinful thing I can do? If I backbite a fellow Muslim, if I gossip about a fellow Muslim, I slander a fellow Muslim, I come and even physically attack a fellow Muslim, isn't that one of the worst things I could do as a Muslim? Now, if we take that further, what if you did it to someone who is related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? If I did it, for example, to Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, do you know she was four months pregnant? Zainab, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, was four months pregnant. One of the people of the Quraysh scared her. She miscarried. That person came on the day of the opening of Mecca. He knew that I had hurt the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And not a daughter who's ma'suma, a daughter who's infallible. No, 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 no. A daughter, a normal daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. When he came to the Holy Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I apologize. Please forgive me. I am the one who caused your daughter to miscarry when she was pregnant and I wanted her to lose her baby. That person could not live with hurting the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Rasulullah continues this. Bukhari says that Rasulullah says, Fatima bad'atun minni. Yu'dhini ma adaha. Fatima is a part of me. Whatever hurts me or whatever hurts her hurts me. That means that anyone who hurts Fatima hurts Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And the Quran says two things. The one who hurts Rasulullah hurts Allah. The one who hurts Rasulullah, la'na is done on them. That means that anybody who has hurt Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam Allah withdraws his rahmah from such people. Anyone who comes and causes pain to Fatima, anyone who causes trouble to Fatima, Bukhari narrates, Fatima the Prophet said is a part of me, whoever hurts her, hurts me. When I now commemorate Fatima, yeah, what's the first hadith that I use? I use this as my first hadith. In this hadith, I can see that Bukhari has narrated, that Fatima, whoever hurts her, hurts me. And we find Muslim and Bukhari narrating another version of this. Fatima bad'atun minni. Now we've already said one. Yu'dhini ma adaha. Now, faman aghdabaha aghdabani. Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Subhanallah. When someone asks you, why do you do Fatimiyah? I say, Baba, Fatimiyah is in Bukhari and Muslim. I don't need to go to my Shia books. Bukhari and Muslim have both shown me why I do Fatimiyah. Rasulullah, why would you say whoever hurts Fatima hurts you? Who's going to dare to hurt Fatima? Fatima, no one would dare to hurt her. But then Rasulullah also says, Fatima, whoever angers Fatima angers me. That if any of you Muslims anger Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam after I have died, then you anger me. And if you anger Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, then you anger Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, in the sharh of this, you know what happened? They knew who these hadiths were referring to. So how did they change them? They said Imam Ali alayhi salam is who these hadiths are about. Because Imam Ali angered Fatima al Zahra by going behind her back to propose for Abu Jahl's daughter. MashaAllah, Imam Ali had no better father in law to go for than Abu Jahl's daughter. Because the enemies of Amir al Mu'mineen, they knew very well these hadiths were too blatant. Fatima is a part of me, whoever hurts her hurts me. Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her angers me. Ya Rasulullah, hurt. You could have just stopped there. No, no, I'm not stopping there. Fatima, whoever hurts her, hurts me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Further than that, whoever she hates, I hate. Yuribuni ma arabaha. It's well written within Bukhari and Muslim. Whoever Fatima hates, I hate. Whatever angers Fatima, angers me. 
Whoever hurts Fatima hurts me. When I bring all of these traditions together, what do I see? I see that Rasulullah has already forewarned that if any of you in the Muslim community, I don't care how many years you've been a Muslim, I don't care what your name is, I don't care what your height is, I don't care what your prowess is. Fatima is a litmus test of your iman. You hurt Fatima, you hurt me. And if you hurt me, there's no salvation for you. You anger Fatima, you anger me. Fatima hates you, then that's the end for you. I put all of that together. Now I have a base of Fatimiyah in Bukhari and Muslim. Bukhari and Muslim have opened the door for me that when someone asks me, why do you Shia come and do Fatimiyah Majalis? I'm like, wait, the Prophet has already said if someone you find in history ever hurts this lady, or if she ever becomes angry, then know that that is my anger. Don't follow such a person. Never, ever follow such a person. Whatever they've done good in their life, because sometimes you'll hear people saying, what if someone's done some good things? And maybe with Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, there may have been a difference. No, 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 no. The Prophet had put a barometer. Fatima, you anger her, you anger me. Forget your salah, forget your psalm. Fatima to Zahra is a litmus test for where your iman is. Because publicly speaking, all of us are mu'min, publicly. Ya Rasulullah, I believe in you, I love you, I follow you. What the heart has is shown by your behavior. That's number one. Number two, Rasulullah in Bukhari reads the musibah for Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. How the Holy Prophet comes to Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Aisha says that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, what happened with him? That he bought Fatima, he sat her down. She says the gate of Fatima was similar to the gate of the Prophet. The Prophet then said something to her. We asked her, what did he say to you? She said to me, it's a secret. I cannot tell you wives. Why? Why can't you tell Fatima to Zahra? If the Prophet told you something, just say it to them. So you say what he just said to you. She said, I cannot say. Until later on, she said to them, not at that moment. Why wouldn't you reveal it straight away what he said? For what reason? Why don't you want them to know? Only later does Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam say, when they ask her, we saw you crying, and then all of a sudden we saw you sad, and we saw you then happy. What was it? She said to me that he is going to be dying shortly, and that is something that made me cry. Then he said to me, and I will be the first to join him. You tell me, why do I do Fatimiyah? My prophet tells Fatima to Zahra, I'm going to be shortly. And then what's going to happen? And then after I pass away, you will be the first to join me. The prophet already had made it clear that Fatima very shortly you will come back. I ask, an 18-year-old comes back that quickly, why? How? What's happened that this 18-year-old will come and join her father? Her father was 63. Her mother Khadija died in her 60s. Why would Fatima come so quickly to you? For what reason? You can't tell me that Fatima al Zahra was sad and she woke up one day and then she just died. What was the reason? What took place? Again, I go back to Bukhari. Bukhari opens another can of worms. What is it? Fatima, Abu Bakr, and Fadak. Fatima, Abu Bakr, and Fadak. Bukhari cannot be explicit about what we commemorate Fatima and why we commemorate Fatima. Because if someone says to you, where do you get this exaggeration that the first Khalifa had a problem with Fatima? Or they all respect each other. They all love each other. I say, Baba, open Bukhari. I don't need to go to Shia books. Let's open Bukhari. And there are a number of narrations in Bukhari and in Muslim about one incident that hurt Fatima, that angered Fatima. What did we say? Fatima bada'atun minni. Yu'dhini ma adaha. Fatima bada'atun minni. Faman aghdabaha. Now we see what does it say in Bukhari and Muslim? 
Bukhari and Muslim narrate two different ways in which Fatima al-Zahra was hurt and in which Fatima al-Zahra was angered. What are the different ways? Firstly, what does Bukhari say? Bukhari says that Fatima al-Zahra had sent someone to the first Khalifa who had confiscated Fadak from Fatima al-Zahra This is not me talking in Shia books. This is Bukhari. The first Khalifa confiscated the land of Fadak. The land of Fadak was a piece of land that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, had done what? He had made sure that he had given this piece of land to Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. When did the Prophet give it to her? Four years before he died. That land was acquired after the Battle of Khaybar. Battle of Khaybar, the Holy Prophet defeated the Jews of Khaybar. After having defeated the Jews of Khaybar, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, the Jews of Fadak said, that you can take our land, we will not fight you. In Islam, if there is a piece of land that is given to you without war taking place, it comes under the economic heading of faith. The Holy Prophet took this piece of land. Allah gives him the sulta to do with that piece of land, whatever he wants to do. Rasulullah receives a revelation from who? He receives a revelation from Jibra'il. Jibra'il comes to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, and he says to him that give this land to Fatima. In honor of what her mother done for the religion of Islam, Allah wants to give this land to Fatima because we know that Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam had given all her wealth towards the religion of Islam. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi takes this land, he gives it to Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. That land belongs to Fatima. In illegal expression, we have a concept, possession indicates ownership. You own a house in Manchester. I come to your house and I say to you that this house belongs to me. At that moment, what happens if you are in possession of the house? Then what happens? Then you are the one possession indicates ownership. You're the one who the house belongs to. I come to you and say, no, it's mine. I have to bring witnesses that it's mine. Isn't it true? You're not the one who has to bring witnesses. The moment Saqifah happened, the first thing that the first Khalifa did, the first thing, confiscate Fadak from Fatima. Fadak was a couple of days journey away from Medina. You've got this plantation, palm trees, fruits were thousands. All of a sudden, the first Khalifa comes forward and he says that we, the narration of the Prophet is that the, we, the Prophets, do not leave behind. Rather, we, what we find is to be treated as sadaqah. He is the only one who narrates this hadith. No one else narrates this hadith. He narrates the hadith. Even though the Quran has no contradiction whatsoever in prophets leaving behind inheritance, Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, when the Prophet said Fatima bada'atun minni, it means her ilm is that ilm which is taught from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Fatima al Zahra sends someone to the first Khalifa. When she sends him, she sends that person and she says to him, Go to him and say that that land belongs to me. The first Khalifa was say, this, if it was in a Shi'i book, you would say that you Shi'a are against the Khulafa. It's not in a Shi'i book. This is Bukhari. You can go online on the internet and you're able to find that hadith clear. First Khalifa, what does he do? He says, by Allah, that the Prophet said, we the Prophets do not leave behind inheritance. What we leave behind is Sadaqah. By Allah, I will not change the state of this sadaqah. By Allah, I will leave it the same way the Prophet left it. And I will dispose of it as the Prophet disposed of it. At that moment, the hadith says, Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr. Shia books. 
Is this a Shia book I'm narrating from? This is Bukhari, Fatimiya in Bukhari. Fatima died angry. Could everyone pause there? We said that Rasulullah said, Fatima is a part of me. Whoever angers her angers me. When you ask me therefore as a Shi'i, why do us Shi'a have a stance against the first Khalifa? I look at the Quran. It says whoever hurts the Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry with them. I look in the Ahadith in Bukhari and Muslim, whoever hurts Fatima hurts me. Whoever angers Fatima angers me. Would you want me to conclude logically? Logically, what do you want me to conclude? That it's all roses at the end? What do you want me to conclude? Fatima, the Hadith is in Bukhari, decides that what? She will be angry with Abu Bakr. And that she dies angry with him. And not just that. She makes it clear that I do not want them to be at the funeral. If you don't want someone to be at your janazah, does that mean you're pleased with them and you want to chill with them in barzakh? If I say to you that I don't want you to be in my janazah, if I die, I don't want you to be there, does that mean I'm happy with you? What does it mean? It means that you've hurt me. Problem. Problem. Fatima bad'atun minni yu'dini ma'adaha. Problem. If Fatima is angry with you, problem. Fatima bad'atun minni. Faman aghdabaha, aghdabani. Whoever angers her, angers me. Problem. Bukhari says that Fatima al-Zahra, her funeral was led by only Imam Ali alayhi salam. And hence why nobody until today knows where Fatima is buried. Bukhari says that. Muslim goes further. Muslim has a conversation where Umar ibn al-Khattab discusses the behavior of Abbas, uncle of Rasulullah, and of Imam Ali alayhim as -salam. What does Umar say? Umar talks about how Imam Ali was unhappy about what had taken place with his share and the share of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab says, and both of you found Abu Bakr as what? This is Sahih Muslim, not Shia books. You found him as being a liar, sinful, treacherous, and deceiving. Whose opinion? Imam Ali. We have Shia today who are like, Imam Ali did not have any problem with the Khulafa. Why are you people making problems? <laughs> Umar admits there was a problem. It's not me. Umar ibn al-Khattab says that Abbas and Imam Ali had a problem with the behavior of the first Khalifa with the share that belonged to Fatima. And that Umar ibn al-Khattab says that both of you saw the first Khalifa as a liar, deceiver, sinful, and treacherous. If Imam Ali saw the first Khalifa in this way, then why do you tell me that you Shia have got it wrong when Sahih Muslim says you saw him in this way? Today, if a Shi'i said this, people will say that you see you Shia, you don't have respect. Do you have respect for the fourth Khalifa? Because the fourth Khalifa doesn't seem to respect the first. Fourth, doesn't respect the first. History wrote it in a way where all four were best friends. Doesn't look like it. You kill my wife, or you hurt my wife, or you anger my wife, I'm not going to be best pleased. But on top of that, when I see Sahih Muslim saying that you and Abbas, meaning Omar says you, Ali, and Abbas, you saw Abu Bakr as being sinful, a liar, treacherous, and deceiving, then when I commemorate Fatimiyah, there was sin and treachery and lying and deceit. It's not me who believed it. Sahih Muslim says Ali ibn Abi Talib believed it. I look at all of that when I add it all together. Is that enough for me to commemorate Fatimiyah? When I come Fatimiyah every year, why do I come? 
because I believe that Fatima Zahra was the victim of oppression, that Fatima Zahra was angered, that Fatima Zahra was hurt. If it was in my Shia books only, I appreciate you saying my books are biased. Now I've shown you in Bukhari and Muslim or Bukhari. Therefore, today when someone comes and tells me this is a Shia belief, yes. Burning of the door of Fatima is a Shia belief. Is the burning of the door in Bukhari and Muslim? No. Is the threat to burn the house of Fatima in Bukhari and Muslim? No. But do these threats exist in other books? Yes. If other non-Shia books mention Umar threatening to burn the house of Fatima, and other works saying that there was a claim that it went further, do I have enough as a Shi'i to commemorate that those last days of Fatima al-Zahra were unpleasant? Is there enough there? In other words, when I come to Bukhari and Muslim, there's more than enough of a picture. Some people ask the question, but Imam Ali being oppressed, is that in Bukhari and Muslim? Yes. Many times people say, that did Ali ibn Abi Talib give a pledge of allegiance? Notice how in Bukhari, it says that Imam Ali alayhi salam, when Fatima al-Zahra was alive, did not pledge allegiance to the first Khalifa. I ask you a question. Fatima al-Zahra died when? When did she die? Couple of months after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Let's go as far as the latest that some might even want to say that six months even. Even if we put all of that together, let's say we put all of that together, why Imam Ali السلام, doesn't pledge allegiance? Bukhari admits that Imam Ali, while Fatima was alive, did not pledge allegiance. Secondly, why does Imam need to pledge allegiance? If your government is a government, why do you need Imam Ali to pledge allegiance? Why don't you just say, we've got the majority at Saqifa, and that's enough for us. You don't need to go any further. Which government goes after people's houses to get forced pledges from them? The first government in Islam was a government that if you did not pledge allegiance to them, they were ready to go to any measure to come after you. When we honor Fatimiyya, this is what we're remembering, that we never want a government one day that forces you to follow them. A government that forces you to follow them has got nothing to do with Islam. A Muslim is someone who has the free will to either say, I agree with this government or I reject this government. No one should ever be forced. Imam Ali السلام, therefore, even in Bukhari, it says Imam Ali did not pledge until after Fatima al-Zahra died. Bukhari says there was a real harsh tone taken against Imam Ali. People clearly had left him. Eventually, Imam Ali afterwards gave a pledge of allegiance to the first Khalifa. Why, Mola, are you waiting so long? Why? If the government is a pure government and a government is the government of Rasulullah, why Nabi Talib is waiting so long? Number two, why Imam Ali has to give his pledge of allegiance? Why don't you just go ahead with your government? And number three, if his wife was against you, if you wanted to force a pledge, what happened if his wife got in the way? Imam al radha was asked, why did Imam Ali not take Fedak back later? Fatima could not get Fedak. Why didn't Imam Ali take it back later when he became Khalifa? Imam al radha said, that which was taken from us, we do not take back from oppressors that, was, that which was taken from us. When an oppressor takes something from me, I don't take it back from him. Unless Allah gives it back to me. When a person therefore has taken something from us, that oppressor, we don't go and beg them to come and give it back to us. That I don't need to do at all. Nor do we need to ask for it at all. Rather, Fedek was a symbol, as simple as that. It was a symbol of the oppression as to why we commemorate Fatima. That a piece of land, do you think Fatima al-Zahra cares about a piece of land? 
Wallah, Fatima al-Zahra, if you knocked at her door and said to her, I want FedEx, I'm a poor person, she'd give the whole of FedEx to you. It wasn't the piece of land. It was to mark a post in history. Never forget what happened to me. My father warned you so many times. Whoever hurts her, hurts me. Whoever angers her, angers me. Whatever angers her, angers me. Eventually, therefore, could history delete Fatimiyya? Subhanallah. Go now to Manchester, any bookshop, Islamic bookshop. Ask them, can I see Sahih al-Bukhari? They'll have it on sale. Can I see Sahih Muslim? They'll have it on sale. Open it. And clearly it's written there, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her, angers me. Fatima is a part of me, whoever hurts her, hurts me. And also there, Fatima died angry with Abu Bakr. And if Fatima died angry with him, then what does that mean? That means something must have taken place for the anger of Fatima is only for Allah. Ahl al-Bayt will never get angry for their own sake. When Amr ibn Wid was on the ground, Imam Ali was about to strike him, Imam walked away. Why Mawla you walked away? Because he spat at me. And I never strike someone who angers me. <coughs> I only strike those <coughs> who anger Allah. Likewise with Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she would never get angry except for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is Bukhari or Bukhari and Muslim, are they a barometer for my whole judgment? No. Rather, simply because they are held in high esteem by others, we use them. Otherwise, for me, I have my own Shia books. Someone says in our Shia books, it's clear, yes? In Al-Kafi Muhsin, the miscarried baby of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, is mentioned within where? Within Al-Kafi, the miscarried baby known as Muhsin or Muhassin. That's in Al-Kafi. Further than that, in Kamil Ziyarat, you have the narrations about the complaint against the attack on Fatima. Further than that, in the Talkhis of Sheikh Al-Tusi, Sheikh Al-Tusi makes it clear that it is in our opinion within the Shi'i school that Fatima al-Zahra died of a miscarriage from her rib being broken and an attack on her house. Therefore, what do we have? Early Sheikh Al-Kulayni, Sheikh Al-Tusi, all of them fill the jigsaw pieces of Bukhari and Muslim's original puzzle. Bukhari and Muslim, give me the puzzle. Fatima, whoever angers her, angers me. Fatima, whoever hurts her, hurts me. Fatima dies angry with Abu Bakr. Fatima does not want anyone to attend her funeral. Imam Ali buries Fatima secretly in the night, so no one at it. What else do you want to put on the jigsaw pieces? How does this lady die at such a young age? And the worst of all things is that not that she dies only, but that she leaves four orphans behind in the house. Yes. It's one thing that we lose Fatima al-Zahra at such a young age. But how difficult was it for those four orphans in the house? Many times people forget that the Ahl al-Bayt, all of them were orphans at one stage or another in their life. Fatima was born, she was an orphan at the age of five. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was an orphan. When he was born, his father had died. Imam al-Hassan, orphan. Imam al-Hussein, orphan. Sayyidah Zainab, orphan. Um Kulthum, orphan. If ever in life you feel that life hasn't treated you well, don't forget that Al Muhammad woke up one morning asking, where is our mother? Whatever trial you go through in life will never be like the trials of Al Muhammad. Whenever you're facing difficulty, remember there was a night when Zainab woke up and said, where's my mother? And for Zainab, those nights came a number of times. If it was only one night, then I would turn around and say what? I would turn around and say she only needed to say that on one night. Her mother, before she died, she wanted her legacy to continue. Not hers, but the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa 
And she knew that when she looked in her daughter's eyes, she knew it was going to be that daughter who would continue the legacy of who would continue the legacy of Rasulullah And that's why she said to her, Zainab, come next to me. Of her life, she said to her, Zainab, come next to me. Zainab came next to her mother Fatima. When she came near her mother Fatima, there was a private conversation between the two of them. The same way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had a private conversation with Fatima al-Zahra when he said to her, I'm going to die, but you will be the first to join me. This time there was a private conversation between who? Between Fatima and Zainab. Did anyone know that conversation? No. Nobody knew that conversation, what was said. When did we find out on the plains of Karbala in the afternoon? Afternoon of the 10th of Muharram, Imam was getting ready to go towards the battlefield. He looked towards his tent. He bid farewell to everyone in the tents. He made sure that everyone pledged their allegiance to the Imam of their time, Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. Then as he began to walk out from the tent, he began to head towards the opposition army. He heard a voice, Mahlan, Mahlan. Ibn Zahra, wait, wait, O oh son of Zahra. At that moment, Aba Abdullah turned around. He looked towards his sister Zainab alayhi salam. And remember these two, how close they were. These two saw their grandfather die. They saw their mother behind the wall and that door. They saw their father struck with a sword. They saw their brother poison affecting his body. And now at this moment, he turned around, he saw Zainab. Where was Zainab in Karbala? Looking towards where? Looking towards Medina. It's as if she had an amana from her mother. What was that amana? She said, Aba Abdullah, come near me. He said to her, what is it, my dear Zainab? She said to him, come closer to me. He got closer to her. She she kissed Aba Abdullah on his neck and then she kissed him on his chest. She said to him, when my mother Fatima was on her deathbed, she said to me, Aba Abdullah will be alone one afternoon on the plains of Karbala. When you see him alone, kiss him on his neck and kiss him on his chest. Why kiss him on his chest? We found out a few moments later when we saw the horses trample on the body of Imam al salam. She said to him, kiss him on his neck. Why? Because Shimmer grabbed the neck of Imam al Hussein as he lay on the plains of Karbala. Zainab she saw a number of things. She saw fire in a house in Medina. She saw a baby die. She saw a slap on a cheek. She saw all of that pain. She saw, she thought to herself, that would be the only time she'd ever see that. If she saw fire in a house in Medina, she saw fire on the in Karbala, yes. If she saw a slap on the cheeks in Medina, she saw Sukaina's cheeks slapped in front of her. But the last one, if she saw a baby die in Medina, she saw Asghar in the hands of his mother in Karbala with an arrow piercing his neck. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Allow us to be amongst those who follow his message, Ya Allah. 
Oh, let us all raise our hands in dua. Ya Allah, raise us and give us the intercession of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Tomorrow night will be the final night of our majalis. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to continue to commemorate Fatima this year and every year, Ya Allah. Insha'Allah, directly after the majlis, we will have an open question and answer session with the whole community. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the organizers of this majlis and for their marhumin with the Surah Al-Fatiha, but before it, the loudest of your salawat. Allah.